Good morning, all. Myself, Dr. K. Srikanth Kumar, Associate Professor, Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, VV Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences. I am going to be act as a chairperson for this session. And uh, welcome to the day five, session two of AICT ISTE refresher program on role of artificial intelligence in drug discovery and development. It's my privilege to introduce the resource person of this session, Dr. Aditya Abhyankar. Dean, Faculty of Technology, Professor and Head, Department of Technology, SP, Pune University, Maharashtra, India. <laughs> Sar is on lean from his duties as Dean and R&D, Director, Center for Excellence in R&D, and Professor in Computer Engineering Department of VIIT, Pune. And Sar is associated as an adjunct professor with COEP, Pune, as a research associate with Clarkson University, USA. And SAR is the, Associ SAR is the advisory committee member and BOS member of many national and international universities. And coming to the educational qualifications of Dr. Aditya Abhyankar, sir, SAR received the BE degree in electronics and telecommunication engineering from Pune University in 2001. Sir received the MS and PhD degrees from Clarkson University, USA in 2003 and 2006, respectively. Sir worked as postdoctoral fellow at Clarkson University, USA in the academic year 2006-2007. Sir also earned MA Sanskrit with specialization in Vedant, where Sir stood university first rank in 2011. Sir also did MBA with finance specialization and uh, MA philosophy. Currently, Sir is pursuing his second PhD in the specialization of Sanskrit subject. And Sir research interests includes pattern recognition, signal and image processing, wavelet analysis and biometric systems. Sir has been 
working as phd guide for various reputed universities and sir has guided and has been guiding doctoral and masters degree students and sir has bagged number of national and state awards like iei scientist of the year 2011 sir cv raman 2015 award from the hands of honorable cm of maharashtra sir has contributed in national level programs for education like nptel at iit bombay sir holds 8 us patents 14 indian patents 7 disclosures 8 technology transfers 5 us copyrights in his credit sir has more than 30 international publications and 40 international conference papers sir has given 25 invited talks in national conferences and 44 international invited keynote addresses in international events sir is the author of seven magazine articles three book chapters two book reviews four short letters eight short book reviews and one book and sir worked as referee for 67 international journals and for 81 international conferences sir has been involved in number of funded research proge- projects and consultancy activities and sir research has attracted funds from international agencies like iucrc and tfrc and also national funding agencies like dst aicte rgstp dit trti tdd etc sir has generated research funding of 2.5 million us dollars and has created state of art of the infrastructure in the field of pattern recognition sir provides consultancy to number of reputed industries like biometrics llc usa vision and d canada optra systems india by design bangalore india etc sir has been closely associated with aadhar project and has contributed significantly in finalizing the norms and standards to be adopted across the country and sir is the director of adjit soft tech private limited which works in creating intelligent frameworks for pattern recognition based solutions and sir is the director of two startups one based out of india and other based out of the usa and with this brief introduction now i request dr aditya abhyankar sir to give a talk on national educational policy hi good morning am i visible and am i audible audible yes sir visible and audible sir yes sir wonderful so just give me a minute i am going to share my presentation and then i will get started so just give oh, me a okay. minute sir okay sir okay aditya sir good morning namaste good morning namaste Dr. sir Ram. Uh, thank nice you sir you. nice to and see you sir you thank you virtually though yes sir exactly sir you are very pioneer in national education policy sir that's it we have chosen you luckily we got your session hmm? yes, my sir. my honor and pleasure sir yes sir thank you sir hmm? please go ahead sir thank you yes yes just give me a minute i'm going yes, to sir.
Okay, so very good morning to one and all. I have shared my presentation. And uh, can you please confirm that my presentation is visible to you? Yes, sir, it is visible. It's visible, wonderful. Thank you, thank you for that feedback. And you can see me and hear me without any issues, without any problems, right? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so very much. So a warm welcome to all the participants and a very good morning to one and all. Uh, at the outset, I truly uh, wish and hope that all of you who have joined this call digitally, you are safe and healthy with your family members and with your loved ones. Uh, this third uh, wave of pandemic uh, is probably going to result into an endemic and very soon this uh, pandemic will be over and we'll be able to conduct these sessions uh, in physical mode uh, and we'll be able to get back to normal very soon. Second, I would like to uh, take this opportunity and congratulate uh, VV Institute of Pharmacy for taking this efforts and uh, putting this platform together and inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share a few of my thoughts on NEP 2020. I think someone's mic is on. Participants, please mute. Sir, I unmuted the mic. You continue. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So uh, I also take this opportunity and thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be part of this uh, very, very August gathering. Uh, this is the most opportune time, in my opinion, that we'll be discussing about uh, the role of NMP. We all are academicians. We all are professors. And uh, since this particular workshop also discusses about artificial intelligence, and uh, the role of using industry 4.0 of uh, nitty gritties towards bringing out um, nuances out of our own research work. It's extremely crucial for us to understand how the new education policy, the national education policy 2020 is going to act as an enabler. And it is really going to empower we, the academicians and the professors, if we understand the power of this policy. And that's what I intend to do in my talk today. Uh, this talk is going to be very, very informal kind of a talk. And that's why my request to all the participants is uh, think on what I'm trying to tell you and feel free to post your questions in the chat box please help me convert this monologue into a dialogue. Let's brainstorm. Let's think about the issues together and let us see if we can form consensus towards the end of this session. Let's get started. Uh, I have titled this talk as NEP 2020 and research whereabouts. And this is because I don't want to discuss the NEP policy in its nuts and bolts. However, I really want to discuss this policy in its spirit. And if we can understand the spirit, then we should be able to make some sense out of this policy. The first and foremost question is, what is so special about this policy? To be very honest with you, in my opinion, the unique feature of this policy is, unlike previous policies, this policy is not created behind the closed doors. So after many discussions and deliberations and uh, involving stakeholders from various different strata, this policy has emerged out. And one very important aspect of NEP 20 is research and the emphasis that has been given on research. And unless we really bring back the research culture in academics, and educational institutions, there is absolutely no fun. And I'm going to ask a few very interesting questions and together we can discuss 
whether we have really missed that bus and do we really have research culture in our institutes and our organizations let's think through let's think about it discuss about it together we all know if you if you see for example the 17th section of nep 2020 it very clearly mentions the importance of the quality of academic research in universities and various different institutes and how we can be enablers and how to uh, catalyze this whole movement of bringing in research culture in our educational strata, so to say. And the first and foremost question is why research is so much crucial? Why research is so much important? And I'm going to share a few teasers with all of you and then together we can discuss and decide whether research is that critical and that important in our ecosystem, so to say. We all know that uh, although a lot has been said and talked about research, we know that research and innovation investment in India is very poor percentage of the total GDP. If we look at few of the developed countries like US, it is close to 2.8% and it is close to uh, above 4% in, in uh, countries like Israel, for example, or South Korea. In our country, it is not even 1%. It is close to 0.7%. And it's extremely important that the innovation index and the innovation investment, they should really cross that 1.5% benchmark in order for us to be able to then significantly contribute in the GDP of our country. It's extremely important that we being academicians and we being educationalists, we should be able to understand the importance of the growth and how we are going to contribute to that growth through research and the excellence and quality in research at academic forums it's very important for us to form consensus and understand the importance of this. We also know that NRF is going to promote research at various different levels. It is going to promote research at universities, institutes, and also in industry. And it is extremely important that we should be able to educate our industry partners. Why? I'm going to discuss about that as well. But it is extremely important that we should act as a licensing institute. We should be able to connect the dots and we should be able to bring our industry partners along with us so that we will be able to carry out research which is relevant to what's happening in industry. Um, you might say that why research? Let's try and figure out that question first. And we know that we are in an era of Industry 4.0. And when it comes to Industry 4, Industry and Academia, they always go hand in hand. So we also have Education 4.0 that's happening in academics. That's not written anywhere. That's not documented anywhere. But in a very subtle manner, we also have uh, Education 4.0 that we can sense around us in academia. And we know that in Industry 4.0, the whole focus shifted from scaling to skilling. And there is some history behind that. And the historical fact tells us that the European market, they really wanted to counter the dominance of Chinese market in terms of mass production. And that's why the scaled industry, they wanted to shift it from scaling to skilling so that every single product will be different. Every single product will be unique and there'll be huge scope for skilling and innovation. That's what Industry 4.0 truly and essentially indicates. And if we really want to survive in this era of Industry 4.0, the only key that lies with us is being adaptive. We should be able to agile and agile enough in order to be able to face the challenges of changing demands from the market. And when the market changes, the reflections are also sensed in education and academia. And that's why we professors should also be ready to adapt quickly to the changes. 
And for doing this, three Ks are extremely important. The first one is know what leading us to knowledge, know how leading us to skill sets and know why leading us to vantage. And if you are smart enough, then we can convert that vantage into an advantage. And for all of this, again, questions which begin with why are always very interesting questions to answer. If you compare the questions which begin with why to other questions which begin with what and how and when, then these are very simple questions. If I ask you what happened in the men's singles final Australian Open yesterday, the answer is simple. Rafael Nadal won and Daniel Medvedev lost. If I ask you when did that happen, you can tell me the date and time of yesterday. If I ask you how did that happen, you can tell me it was a five setter, you can tell me the score. But if I ask you why did Nadal win and why did Medvedev lose, then every one of us can have our own analytical pieces and we will have our own perspectives. And that's why questions which begin with why are always interesting questions and the answers are not singleton. There are multiple folds and as we keep unfolding these different layers, very interesting analytical pieces would emerge out. And that's why questions which begin with why are always searching questions leading us to research. And that's why there is a lot of emphasis on research in NEP 2020. We also know that this is the most opportune time we are discussing this because a lot has been said about innovation, incubation and entrepreneurship. This is the most opportune time. Previously, we had very interesting policies like Stand Up India and Make in India and Digital India. And now that is very strongly supported by NEP. NEP gives us a lot of flexibility, a lot of freedom without compromising the academic rigor, but it really provides us a lot of flexibility and freedom. And why that flexibility and freedom is required, we are going to discuss that with the help of a couple of very interesting examples. But that freedom and flexibility is indeed essence of any academic strata. We also know that entrepreneurship cannot happen unless we have an ecosystem in place. And that's why the challenge lies in converting uh, the thought process from not working to networking. It's extremely important. And we have realized the importance of that. And that's why in academia, we are bringing in the complete setup of mentors who are both technical mentors as well as business mentors. We have realized the importance of IP management intellectual property, how to create patents, how to have copyrights, how to convert these patents into commercially tangible propositions, how to do licensing, how to do the complete technology transfers and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of awareness about our IP creation in educational sector now. And the base of that is creative thinking and smart approach. And yet, after having all of this in place, we know that there is not even 1% of the startups who will eventually survive and they will become success stories. So why majority of the startups, they don't take off? And one of the reasons why this happens is because there is lack of research culture. And if we really want to have more success ratio in our startups, if we really want to have a very strong foundation on which these young budding entrepreneurs, they can then have their building set up, it's important to bring the research culture back in academia. Now you might say that, why are we discussing this so much? We already have research culture. Majority of our professors are now PhD holders and our PhD programs are so strong and there are so many PhD guides and there are so many institutes across the country and we are producing so many PhDs and so many masters and thesis and dissertations. But do we really have research culture? That is the question. And 
to be very honest with you in my opinion research is no more a luxury it has become an absolute necessity and what do we mean by research so when i say research i am not strictly and only talking about the very structured academic research that typically happens you have to publish papers and uh, come up with um, legitimate white papers and patents i'm not only talking about that sure that's one important part of it but that is not everything what i really mean by research is your bent of mind and once a researcher always a researcher so what i mean by research is not accepting the things blindly not copying anybody being original being unique being different and uh, truly going out on a limb stepping out of your comfort zone asking searching questions challenging your wit going out on a limb that's what research is all about and do we really get enough opportunities to do research in academia if you rewind and go back to first standard and if you remember what we have done from first standard to 10th standard we do exactly what our peers do so not not a single opportunity to be unique not a single opportunity to be different and original and we are not asking for too much because we all are born original we all are born unique we have unique fingerprints we have unique faces unique voice unique speech unique gait unique keystroke dynamics unique hand geometry unique skull size unique uh, shape of the ears everything is unique and then the education uh, creates copiers out of us we start copying each other's patterns so subtly and eventually we lose this art of doing independent thinking in research ability to think independently ability to think without anybody's support is the key and somewhere we have lost that art and if we really want to understand what is the meaning of research i will share a very funny but very interesting story with all of you and this story is taken from plato's literature so you must have heard of the trio of philosophers from greece where socrates was the ultimate guru and plato was his disciple and plato's disciple was aristotle who went on to become the guru of alexander the great so plato is the connecting link between socrates and aristotle and plato has written number of brilliant books and one of his books is the republican and i have taken this story from that particular book so this story is about two friends traveling in a desert and out of the two friends one is a blind fellow so unfortunately that person cannot see and the other one is a normal fellow just like you and me and while walking in the desert that normal fellow says oh for a cup of milk see if you are traveling in a desert and if one feels thirsty one should not drink water otherwise you will feel even more thirsty that's why people drink milk so he says oh for a cup of milk and the blind friend possesses a question he says my dear friend you are saying oh for a cup of milk now cup i know i have sensed it i have touched it but can you please help me understand what do you mean by milk and this normal friend says oh it's very simple don't worry i will explain it to you and he answers back saying that milk is a kind of white liquid and the blind friend again poses a question he says liquid i know i have sensed it i have touched it but can you please help me understand what do you mean by white the only color i know since my birth is unfortunately black so can you please help me understand what do you mean by white and this friend of his he says oh it's very simple don't worry i will explain it to you and he answers back saying that white is the color of swan's feathers 
राजहंस नाम का जो पक्षी होता है उसके पंखड़ियों का जो रंग होता है दैट इज व्हाइट सो सी इंस्टेड ऑफ सिंप्लीफाइंग द थिंग्स ही इज अननेसेसरली कॉम्प्लिकेटिंग इट मे बी ही वॉज अ प्रोफेसर इन वन ऑफ द इंस्टीट्यूट that's just on the lighter vein but i'm sure that all the professors who have joined today we believe in simplifying complex things but he says that white is the color of swan's feathers now the blind friend again poses a question and he says feathers i know i have sensed it i have touched it but can you please help me understand what do you mean by a swan and now this normal friend realizes that there is a counter question coming back at him for every possible explanation that he is giving and that's why he realizes that this is not as simple as he would have thought of so this time he thinks for a while and says that swan is a bird with a crooked neck and the blind friend again comes up with a question he says neck i know even i have a neck but can you please help me understand what do you mean by crooked and now this normal friend really gets irritated so what he does is he stretches out hand of his blind friend and he says this is what i mean by straight tell me do you understand the blind friend says yes then he bends that hand in between and says this is what i mean by crooked tell me do you understand and the blind friend very calmly answers back saying that oof now i understand what you meant by milk <laughs> so just see from where they started and where they ended the story is interesting but what we can derive out of this story is even more interesting so what can we conclude out of this story don't walk in desert or if you are walking in a desert don't have a blind friend by your side who is pestering you with all crazy questions not really that's just on the lighter vein what we can really conclude out of this story is many times many of us are as blinded as the normal fellow in this story with our preconceived notions with our own sweet areas of biases and ignorances and negligence and research is one platform where no question no inquiry is a stupid question and stupid inquiry there is potential in every question we can get rid of any and every kind of a shackle and that's why research allows us to think freely that wilderness in thinking is extremely important and many times that formal structure the formal academic structure it doesn't give us enough opportunity to think freely and research is one platform where we get that opportunity we can think freely we can explore areas that we haven't explored before and no question is stupid question no inquiry is silly inquiry and the most important thing that happens due to research is it helps us build differentiating characteristics it's important to be different it's important to be unique because we are born unique and unless we develop our own perspective unless we develop our own style of thinking as professors it's very difficult for us to survive in this era because just imagine because of covid now everything has gone digital there is literally a hitting of a fast forward button what otherwise would have happened in 5 to 6 odd years that has literally happened in 5 to 6 odd months all academic institutes they have started using lms and moodle and moocs so just imagine if i am teaching a course on machine learning there are so many courses available on internet so why my students they will be interested in listening to what i am telling them unless my explanation my insights are original they are my perspectives and you will not be able to develop your own perspective unless you are doing research so the biggest boon that we get out of our research is it helps us create differentiating characteristics our independent thinking our ability to think through our ability to think in a very different manner 
adds to the perspective and that's what is really important and unless we bring that on table our students they will not feel like um, listening to what we are trying to tell them and that's why for faculty members particularly it's very important to have these differentiating characteristics with you i'll skip the fourth bullet point and uh, the importance of differentiating characteristics is not limited only to individuals but it is going to also have its impact at national level it's very important that academicians and educationalists should be able to educate our industry partners and for one simple reason if we take an example of it sector which is one of the fastest growing sectors in our country and if i ask you which is the biggest indian company indian it company then what is the answer of this question you can type your answers in chat box or you can unmute and give your answers which is the biggest it company of indian origin any answers i'll quickly check the chat box So do we have any answers for this? Anyone which is the biggest uh, IT company of Indian origin? That is the question. Okay, there is one answer Infosys from A Vishwanath. Okay. Any other answers? Okay, from chairperson we are getting answer TCS. Lovely. So at least there are two good answers. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I hope you are still able to see my uh, presentation. So the answer of this question is TCS. It is Tata Consultancy Services. Infosys is the second largest company and Wipro is the third largest in terms of its volume. And then we also have Persistent Systems and Zensar and KPIT and there are so many other IT companies of Indian origin. And the biggest one is TCS and it does not stand for tea coffee snacks. It stands for Tata Consultancy Services. So we are saying it loud and open that we are into providing services from services to solutions to tools to frameworks to applications and finally into products. It's a long, long journey. And unless we really bring back the research culture, we will not be able to produce product companies in our country. And that's why it's extremely important that we should bring back research culture in academia so that eventually it, it will lead to having good sound product companies in our country. And for that also, it's extremely important. I'm, I'll just share a parody that was created. You might ask me this question that why are you talking so much about differentiating characteristics? Um, in 1971, I don't know how many of you watch uh, Hindi movies, but I mean, this is just on lighter main. So in 1971, a movie came out and the name of that movie was Bandhan. And it was a nice family drama. And uh, the hero's role was played by Jitendra, uh, a very popular actor of 60s and 70s and 80s. And his mother's role was played by Durga Khote, another veteran actress. And in one of the scenes, the hero comes running back home and says, Ma, I BA pass. Ho gaya. He tells his mother that now I am BA, Bachelor of Arts. And the mother becomes so happy that immediately she cooks Gajjar ka halwa. And this is because in 1971, BA was equivalent to settling down in life, license to getting married to heroine of the movie, and uh, 
it was good enough now if they make a remake of that movie in 2022 and they will right because they have ran out of stories and they are remaking all the old and golden movies uh and if the hero comes running back home and says ma mai btech pass ho gaya now i am an engineer we are talking about smartphones and smart cities so super intelligent moms no gajjar ka halwa the first question will be campus hua kya and if the poor hero says yes ma ho gaya still no gajjar ka halwa the next question will be package kitna hai and if the hero comes up with good package still no gajjar ka halwa the next question will be what are the plans for higher education gre mad zat pat cat and there are so many opportunities and the questionnaire will go on and on and on because just imagine in 2022 how many institutes do we have in our country and how many graduates and post graduates and phd's are we producing and there is literally a rat race out there and unless and until we have differentiating characteristics our own perspective our own independent thinking it will be very difficult for us to survive and that's why doing research like i said before is no more a luxury it has become an absolute necessity uh having said that we need to accept this with a pinch of salt uh if you see section 9.2 of this nep 2020 it very clearly says that there is a limited number of autonomous institutes and there is limited number of professors who really understand the autonomy and having freedom is a big boon but it's important that there should be human resource who will understand that and as a consequence of that there is lesser emphasis on research in majority of the universities and colleges and there is lack of competitive peer reviewed research funding across disciplines this is what nep very clearly states and very clearly brings out so nep very loudly tells us that we lack research culture in in general in academia uh see in pharma or in technology or in architecture uh one of the premium institutes are iits indian institute of technologies and even in iits their premium product is btech and then mtech and then phd and in iits we produce btechs who eventually go to stanford's and mit's of the western world to pursue their higher education and that's why in some sense we are producing raw material for the western world in our top universities top institutes we need to really imbibe the spirit of research and bring that research culture in our academic strata now you might ask me that is it that sensitive have we really lost the bus have we really missed the bus and in order to uh, give you the answer in a very crisp manner i am going to share couple of teasers with all of you and these teasers are in fact two very funny questions that i used to ask as a small kid and never got satisfactory answer and the first question is connected with the basic concept of keeping the time and the second question is connected with the the very basic concept of keeping up with the space and the first question that i used to ask which is connected with time is what is so special about 60 why do we have 60 seconds in a minute and why 60 minutes in an hour what is so special about 60 we are very comfortable with decimal system so why not have 10 seconds in a minute and 10 minutes in an hour for example what is so special about that number 60 and the second question that i used to ask is why do we get odd number of days in the month of february is it not really strange we start our calendar in jan and all the months they have either 30 or 31 days and then we stumble upon in the second month february with odd number of days either 28 or if we are in leap year 29 why 
In fact, let's play a game. I work in the field of machine learning and we write algorithms which are iterative. And we say iteration after iteration, the algorithm marches on towards the optimum solution. So there is this popular saying in English, they say march on towards your target. They never say January on, do they? And in army, they sing marching songs. So let's play a game. Let March be the first month of our new calendar system. And then we get April and May. And as we continue, and as we are in the seventh month, in Sanskrit, seven is Sapta. And from Sapta, we get September. And eight is Ashta. And from that, we get October. And nine is Navam. And from that, we get November. And 10 is Dasham, leading us to December. And now January becomes 11th month and February now becomes the 12th and the last month. So now it makes sense to have odd number of days in Feb, provided we start our calendar in March. And then I'm doing that adjustment in the last month of my calendar. This makes a lot of sense also, because in nature, you will see that new things would start to happen by around March or April. In uh, Maharashtra, we call it as Vasanta Panchami, which is going to be on 5th of February, probably this year. So by around Feb, March, April, we get uh, the Vasanta Rutu. And in nature, the trees would blossom, they would propel, there would be new branches, and in nature, there is a lot of new growth. And that's why it's very symbolic to start our new year by around that time. If you look at Hindu New Year or Buddhist calendar or Chinese system or old Japanese system or even old Roman system, Iranian calendar, they all suggest starting our year by around March or April. And yet, not just you and me on this call, but the entire universe, the entire globe, follows this logically illogical calendar. That insensitive we have become. The moment we get up, we are interested in figuring out what day and what date it is. And yet, we are not asking important questions. We are just blindly accepting the calendar that has been given to us. It's very important that in research, we should not accept anything blindly. We should ask interesting questions and curiosity, inquisitiveness is the driving force. So what drives everything in research is the curiosity and inquisitiveness. Unless our students are curious, unless our students are inquisitive, unless they realize the importance of asking, searching, interesting questions, we may not be able to do justice. And that's why it's very important that the curiosity and inquisitiveness must be nurtured and nourished in academia if we really want to bring the research culture back. Now, you might say that, so what? We are following crazy calendar system. It is not doing any harm to us. Well, indirectly it does. And to give you more direct examples, in Maharashtra, our capital is Mumbai. And before the British came, we had three capitals at Pune and at Satara and at Kolhapur. And the British, they moved it to Mumbai. And Mumbai is not even a place, bunch of islands. You have to create uh, infrastructure by building bridges and by creating artificial land. And uh, we have invested crores and crores of rupees. For British, it was very convenient because for them, they really wanted sea next to it so that the commutation would be easier and more convenient. But after the British left, we could have moved the capital back to Pune or Kolhapur or Satara or whatever place it could be. But we did not have thinking manpower. And this is all because of the British educational system that we have imbibed, unfortunately. And that's why, because we did not have thinking manpower, we accepted Mumbai as our capital. 
and we have invested or vested crores of rupees just to create infrastructure and after doing all of this four hours of rainfall for four inches good enough to paralyze the city for a good four days uh, you might be reading this in the newspaper the mumbai traffic gets completely jammed and blocked for four five six days and it's crazy because mumbai is four five feet below sea level and there is no scope for water to get drained out it is so unfortunate if we move little down south again we had a great capital city in mysore and then it got shifted to bangalore which has now become bangaluru now see you have to have river next to any big city for that city to grow and prosper and the only exception to this rule is bangalore it's so unfortunate that four states are fighting over kaveri issue who is going to consume how much percentage of water of kaveri and again we have invested or vested crores of rupees just to provide water supply to the city of bangalore or bangaluru and this is because we did not have thinking manpower in british educational system it's all about memorization there is hardly any scope for comprehension understanding realizing the concepts and then creating your own patterns there is hardly any scope for creativity there is hardly any scope for innovation and it's very important that we being academicians we should realize the importance of bringing back that culture because to be very honest with you we had that culture in our country we had that culture jokingly i say that what we had initially was gurukul system and the british gave us kula guru system and it is 180 degrees out of phase and unfortunately we have lost the legacy that we had in our country if you see any of our manuscripts they are dialogues for example bhagavad gita is a dialogue between krishna and arjun because arjun could ask many interesting questions lord krishna came up with even more beautiful answers or ashtavakra gita is a dialogue between king janak and sage ashtavakra chandogya upanishad is a dialogue between shweta ketu and uddalak aruni you look at any scripture it is in the form of dialogue and unless students are encouraged to ask questions unless there is curiosity jignasa there is absolutely no fun the first sutra in brahma sutra is athato brahma jignasa so there is that jignasa curiosity or the first karika in sankhya karika is dukkhatre vigata tad vighatake heto jignasa so everything was driven by curiosity inquisitiveness ability to ask interesting questions unfortunately the educational pattern that we have imbibed from the british we often rely only on memory students should by heart the things and they should reproduce it at the time of examination which is very important it's very important part of your um, intellectual quotient the ability to memorize and reproduce sure but it is not everything memorization is important but so is comprehension understanding and taking it to the conceptual level it's very important that we should understand this and imbibe the research culture in its true spirit if that happens then serendipity will happen and majority of the discoveries and inventions they have happened by accidental serendipity and many interesting inventions and accidents are then bound to happen and to support my hypothesis i'm going to give you a few very interesting technical examples uh, the first one is the story of three idiots we all know that we are in an era of industry 4 and iot and artificial intelligence and the systems that we are trying to create should be intelligent systems smart systems semi smart systems and the kernel function or the basis function of these systems are the key for designing such very interesting and robust systems 
and we know majority of the times it is the fourier transform that has revolutionized many of the solutions that we see in the modern era and if we really try and understand how fourier transform works then dr fourier was trying to excite a known linear shift invariant system with a complex exponential kernel e with a known uh, independent variable let's say frequency omega 0 and then he realized when that happens then what comes out of the system is the same function and such functions which emerge out by only getting scaled up or scaled down are what are known to us as eigen function so he has already said and proven that complex exponential is the eigen function of any linear shift invariant system and all the instantaneous values of k eigen values they eventuate into giving us the discrete fourier transform so this is one way of realizing and understanding fourier transform but the question is what is so special about this constant e and we know that it's an irrational constant but if we approximate it then approximated value of this constant is 2.7183 and we might pose this question come on this is not a very handsome constant it's not a very good looking constant instead of that my name is aditya abhyankar so i will give you a very handsome good looking constant a a is equal to 3 and instead of using this complex exponential let's start using my constant will that give us the complete legacy of transforms the answer of this question is no so there has to be something very special about this constant e and to realize that i'm going to run you through story of three idiots um but not this story because probably you have already seen this story but again in my story there are three idiots and by idiots we mean genius genius scientists but my story took place in 16th century so it's not a color story it's a black and white story and so you have to traverse little backwards in time with me and the first idiot the first genius in this story is not r madhavan so all r madhavan fans please pardon me but the first genius in this story is dr bernoulli jacob bernoulli and dr bernoulli was trying to help out his banker friend and he expanded upon the existing formula of compound interest 1 plus 1 upon n bracket raised to n and he said let's apply limit so that n tends to infinity and you can actually do this in matlab quickly and you will realize that it saturates to an approximated value of 2.7183 so a case of accidental invention accidental discovery accidentally he was able to invent this constant however it remained unutilized for close to 50 odd years and that's where comes the second idiot the second genius in this story whose name is euler or euler and he gave us euler's identity which was e to the power i pi is equal to minus 1 and in engineering we use the derived version of this identity e to the power i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sin theta and this essentially means that if you have exponential curve then any point on this curve if you draw the tangent the slope of the tangent matches with its y intercept so any point can be disseminated equally along x and y axis provided they are orthogonal just like cos and sin with a phase difference of 90 and because of this very interesting invention all the transforms are orthogonal and then obviously the most genius of the three fourier who was thinking about only sine waves and cos waves and he gave us the complete structure if you have periodic signal fourier series a periodic signals fourier transform so it is the culmination of thought process by these three genius scientists that we have the complete legacy of transforms a case of serendipity accidentally they were able to invent this so research happens by apparent accidents and unless we allow enough openness and freedom and flexibility in academia 
we won't be able to have these accidents. I will give you just a few quick examples. Google. Today, Google literally knows everything about every one of us. And it happened by serendipity. When two research scholars, PhD scholars from Stanford University, they came together and started Google. And today, all the modern business propositions are data driven. By the way, I just have a quick question for the organizers. How much time do I have? Another 10, 15 minutes? Up to 1245, sir. Okay, so I, I have uh, another 20 minutes, 25 minutes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So I will also share with you my own experience at Google. What happened? Uh, I was very fortunate. I went to MIT Boston for pursuing my master's. And then in 2000, I did my summer internship at Google. And I could not understand their business model. I'm talking about 2000. It was an era of Y2K. You, many of you may remember this. People were talking about Y2K and the whole computing is going to collapse. And Google was the only company who announced that we are using grid computing and overnight they became popular. Um, so in 2000, I went to Seattle to do my internship at Google's headquarters back then. And what I saw was sprawling campus of 600 odd acres and they had some 70 odd buildings. Every building was seven floored and there were human beings like you and me in just one of those buildings. In all other buildings, they had state of the art servers and they were crunching the data in and out from across the globe. Trillions of dollars of investment. And I could not understand their business model. Trillions of dollars invested. And what was the product of Google as a company? google.com i'm talking about 2000 a harmless platonic search engine which was apparently free for everyone to use they will never charge you one rupee or one dollar or one euro if you want to search anything on google so apparently it is free so trillions of dollars of investment and the product that emerges out of company google.com the search engine is free for everyone to use. There are no irritating pop-up advertisements. In those days, the contemporaries were Yahoo and Rediff and Hotmail, who were also news dissemination portals, but Google was never a news dissemination portal. So how Google was able to generate their revenue and profits, it was not clear. And there were only two possibilities. A, either they were saints and godly saint people I and mean, they were doing this for the betterment of mankind which was obviously not the case or two there was a very shrewd long-term business plan that was hidden beneath i think someone's mic is again on so can you please mute yourself someone's mic is on sir i muted continue yeah thank you and <clears throat> so uh, i simply could not figure this out how they are earning their revenue and slowly and gradually i started realizing it and in fact if we take a snapshot of what google has done to us in last 20 22 odd years probably we will understand and realize what's happening so in 2000, they announced that we are using grid computing and they became very popular. In 2001, a very unfortunate incident took place, 9-11. The twin towers were brought down, a terrorist attack. By the way, this was the same day, 9-11, when in 1893, Swami Vivekananda uttered his golden words in all religion assembly and Chicago, sisters and brothers of America. The same day, unfortunately, the Twin Towers in Manhattan were brought down. And people were searching about it on Google. And they could not find anything because Google was not fed live in those days. 
So immediately in 2002, they introduced Google Live. So now if there is a cricket match going on, uh, you can follow it live on Google. So all the data is fed live for Google. In 2004, they introduced the concept of comprehensive search. So if you type in Aditya Abhyankar in one single click, you will be able to uh, figure out everything about me. My videos, my images, my papers, my patents, everything. So it's called as comprehensive search. In 2006, they leveraged upon already existing concept of IoT, Internet of Things. In 2008, they introduced the concept of semi-smart gridding. In 2010, they introduced the concept of intelligent frameworks. And finally, in 2013-14, they announced that we are in an era of big data, data which is truly big in terms of volume, variety and velocity. And today, Google literally knows everything about every one of us. Where do I stay? Where do I work? Which is the route that I take to go to my workplace from my home? All majority databases are connected to Google. Cheapdictickets.com, yatra.com, bookmyshow.com. Uh, majority of our bank accounts are connected with Gmail accounts. So Google knows which banks I have my account to. Google knows which movies I like to go to. Google knows what are my preferred destinations for going with my family or for my business. Google literally knows everything about every one of us. Google also knows our digital footprint when it comes to um, shopping because Flipkart and Amazon, everything is connected to Google. Google literally knows everything about every one of us. We use Google Maps. So gone are the days when kids, they used to ask their parents and students, they used to ask their teachers and colleagues, they used to ask questions to their peers. For all of us now today, our best friend is Google. And so much so that in English, it has become a verb. We say Google it. And for all of us, our best friend is Google. And that's why there is a concept called as SEO, search engine optimization. And even when we are surfing casually on internet using Google, and if we click on something very casually, that gives them back huge amount of revenue through SEO or search engine optimization. Google could do this because they have a very strong research team. They were ahead of their time. They could create their own market rather than relying on the existing market. And this is possible only if you have a very strong research culture in our organization. If we really want to have product companies like Google and Apple and Microsoft and Dell, it's important to bring back that research culture. Otherwise, we will only have service culture in IT. And I'm not talking about just IT. You look at any spectrum, you look at any field, this is the case. In automobile sector, we are only assemblers. We are not producing products. For example, in automobile sector, one of the best examples that we often quote is that of Maruti cars. But what is the logo on Maruti cars? It is not M, it is S. And S stands for Suzuki because the engines are original Suzuki Japanese engines. And we are predominantly into assembling the parts. It's very important to create product companies. Only product companies will help generate more and more percentage of innovation index getting into GDP and only that will help us bring betterment in terms of quality and not only quantity. It's important to understand this significance of having product companies in our country and Google is the perfect example of that. I'm going to share a few more interesting examples with you and then probably I will stop. You must have heard of this genius scientist. His name is Ron Jen. He was a chemist and 
he had broken marriage so his wife was furious on this scientist because the scientist would spend most of his time in his laboratory and so one day the wife decided that she will visit the laboratory of the scientist and destroy uh, all the experiments so the wife of this genius scientist came to his lab and she started destroying his experiments and accidentally her hand fell on <clears throat> one of the radioactive materials and when that happened it was a accident apparent accident and when that happened the first modern x-ray image picture got captured you can google about it you can also see the wedding ring in the one of the fingers and this is hand of ronjen's wife but research is not just about doing your work it's also about honesty integrity and transparency see the character of this genius scientist they say personality is what you have when everyone is watching and character is what you have when no one is watching and see the character of this scientist he said i really don't know what kind of rays are these and in mathematics if we don't know anything then we typically use x to indicate that it's an unknown variable so he said let's call them some rays x rays and even today we call these rays as x rays he could have very well said that hey these rays are invented in my lab so they should be named after me so they should be called as ronjen rays or r rays why x rays but see the honesty of the scientist and he said i really don't know i haven't done the characterization so let's call them as some rays x rays another case of serendipity and apparent accident and how the scientist was able to um uh, invent something accidentally this is a very interesting example from our own country the great great ramanujan a genius scientist a genius mathematician from the southern part of our country and uh, he wrote letters to many mathematicians in those days and this was one of the very famous riddle in those days 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 going all the way till infinity is equal to what and the common sense tells us that it will be infinite because we will keep adding the numbers and it goes all the way till infinity so it has to be infinite but ramanujan said well it is not infinite and he said it will be minus 1 over 12 and people said minus 1 over 12 first why minus and why 1 over 12 and today we know that he was really ahead of his time and there is a hypothesis it's called as riemann's hypothesis if you are interested read about it it's a very interesting piece of work and in riemann's hypothesis there is a special case if you plug in zeta value to be equal to minus 1 then you actually get this answer so what ramanujan proposed is a very special special case study of plugging in zeta is equal to minus 1 in riemann's hypothesis and today we admire and appreciate the beauty of this apparent accidental invention another case of serendipity this is an interesting story that happened in united kingdom in london here is a lord and he was very popular in london and one rainy evening he went out for a stroll in his chariot and his chariot got stuck in a mud and there was a farmer who was staying by in countryside and he came to the rescue of this lord and he was able to pull the chariot out of the mud and the lord was overwhelmed and he said my dear farmer friend i want to help you and the farmer said don't worry i mean i haven't done much and the lord said no i insist please tell me how can i help you and if you really want to do something for me uh, help uh, educate my son 
and the lord was very happy so he took the responsibility of educating the son of this farmer the son of this farmer went on to become a popular scientist later on he got well educated and then he became a very popular scientist and he had invented a drug which was not yet tested and it was not yet certified and see how life comes back full circle son of this lord fell critically ill and he was un- and all the doctors said that probably we should try the new drug that has been uh, found but not yet certified and miraculously that drug saved life of son of this lord i am talking about two genius personalities here the son of the farmer is alexander fleming who accidentally invented penicillin and when the penicillin dose was given the life of son of the lord was saved and his name is winston churchill who then went on to become the prime minister of united kingdom no doubt he did many ugly things to our country india but uh, he also did many good things for england and again all of this happened by serendipity apparent accidental discoveries this is one very interesting case again from our own country the great tatas and we all know that jrd was an aviator he was the first aviator of our country and after the after uh, having his own aviation uh, company which was tata aviation in those days which later on uh, he was able to sell to our own government and tata aviation then became air india and now air india has gone back to tatas we know the history but in those days uh, we wanted to have bomber planes with us with the air force and we requested americans to give bomber planes and it could be because of our proximity with russians americans they denied giving us the fighter bomber planes and jrd was helping on creating indigenous technology and creating our own fighter bomber planes he did that he came up with his own designs and then he invited the americans to test the bomber planes and the americans got so impressed that in their report they mentioned that the fighter bomber planes produced by the tatas are better than what we have with us and instead of they giving us the bomber planes later on we started giving americans the fighter bomber planes so you can see one of the fighter bomber planes in the backdrop and you can also see a very young ratan tata in the right of this picture i will give you one last example and then i will summarize this was in 1955 uh, the importance of uh, freedom in education so in 1955 this was post second world war and we know that in world war 2 uh, the communication was the key and after the second world war a lot of research a uh, funding was centered around the communication and the protocols for communication and so on and so forth and in those days the encoding protocols by shannon and fano which are what are known to us as shannon fano codes were very popular and out of this duo shannon and fano professor fano was a professor at mit but in 1955 he offered a summer course at perdi university he was teaching a course on information security and in the class he announced that if a student can crack the course project then he will be exempt from writing the end semester examination and in his class there was one genius genius but very lazy student and he because he was lazy he wanted to avoid writing the end sem examination so he said let me give a shot to the course project and while solving that course project he came up with his own encoding technique the name of this student is huffman and today we use huffman codes every now and then 
they are part of mpeg layer 7 they are part of h.264 and 265 right now this whole program is getting conducted digitally and we are sharing the live video streaming so the encoding protocols which are used beneath they also use huffman encoding technique and all of this could happen because of the openness and the flexibility in academia it's important to provide our students such kind of opportunities it's important that we should let them set free and the wilderness in their thinking the openness and the freedom in their thinking is the key for very interesting pieces of research. I will summarize. Uh, like I said before, in my honest opinion, research is no more a luxury. It has become an absolute necessity. Mathematical, mathematical modeling is at the heart of majority of the research. We know that majority of the inventions and discoveries are apparent accidents. They appear to be accidents to all of us. A lot of blood and sweat must have gone in, but at least they appear to be accidents to us. And the accidents are bound to happen, but one has to walk the path. And for walking the path, one has to see the path. And by virtue of doing discussions and deliberations and brainstormings of such kind, by virtue of exchanging ideas with like-minded researchers, I'm sure all of us will start seeing our path. Once we start seeing our path, we'll start walking that path and then many sweet technical and scientific accidents are then bound to happen that will get converted into inventions and discoveries. And for that, happy, happy researching. And I'm sure that such kind of research will lead us to innovations, incubations and startup. Thank you so very much for your very patient hearing. I once again take this opportunity and thank the organizers for first of all creating such a wonderful platform and second for inviting me and making me part of this August August gathering. I truly appreciate your patient hearing and if there are any questions of any kind, any sort, I'll be more than happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir, Dr. Aditya, sir. And really, it's a wonderful talk, sir, related to national educational policy and uh, importance of research, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and institutional autonomy, and uh, how the inventions are made uh, serendipitously. OK, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Pleasure, what spends, you. If you have any queries, you can ask the questions. Any questions from the participants? I think there is no questions, sir, from the sure. participants. And uh, it's time to honor the today's uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Aditya, sir, with the uh, e-certificate. So please accept the e-certificate. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Truly appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's our pleasure, sir. <laughs> and thank you, sir, for giving uh, this wonderful talk on a national education policy. Thank, thank you, you so much, sir. Thank you. And this is informative to all the participants. Uh, the feedback link and the assessment link was provided in the chat box. You can fill the feedback link and assessment link for this session. And we will again meet for the next session at 1.30 p.m. Once again, I repeat, the feedback link and assessment link was provided in the chat box. You can fill and submit the feedback link and assessment. And again, we will meet the next session at 1.30 p.m.